Hi, I'm Nigel and this is Nigel Goes to Space. Today I'm going to be talking about the exciting new news that we're getting from the edge of the solar system as the New Horizons spacecraft goes past the remote world Pluto and is sending back new results which are puzzling and astonishing the scientists. But let's get Pluto in perspective. It was discovered in 1930 by an American astronomer called Clyde Tombow, and we always knew that it was a quite a small world. And as people have measured its size over the years, it's got smaller and smaller, or to be more accurate, the precise measurements have shown it's smaller than anybody believed at first. Let me show you. If this melon here is our planet Earth, then we've got a moon, and our moon is quite big compared to the Earth, it's about a quarter of the size, so it's like this apricot. If we move out to Pluto, Pluto, you see how tiny it is, we now have the latest results. It's no bigger than a big cherry as compared to the melon Earth. And that's why people have now reclassified, back in 19, 2006, the International Astronomical Unit said Pluto would no longer be called a planet, it would be called a dwarf planet. And it's got a big moon going around it. The moon is called Charon, which is about half the size of Pluto itself. So before New Horizons got there, this was about all that we knew. A small world with a comparatively big moon way out beyond the orbit of Neptune. By 1989, we sent unmanned spacecraft to all the planets of the solar system, from Mercury way out to Neptune. And uh, a group of scientists got together and said, well, what about Pluto? What kind of an object is that going to be? And in 2006, early in that year, a spacecraft was launched to go and explore this distant world. It was called New Horizons because it was looking into the region of the solar system beyond the main planets. And it was launched faster than any other object has been sent into space before or since, 60,000 kilometres per hour. Now compare that with how fast the speed on your car speedometer goes up to. And to put it into context, that was 30 times faster than a rifle bullet travels. It was a small spacecraft by interplanetary standards, about twice the size of this kitchen table that I'm sitting at. Uh, but it is all functioned. After nine and a half years in space, all the systems were functioning well. And as it's homed in on Pluto in the middle of July, we were all in a sense of keen anticipation. As it went past Pluto, all the time, all the instruments were looking at Pluto. They were not sending signals back to Earth, but the very next day, the first results were beamed down, and they were absolutely astounding. Even as New Horizons was approaching Pluto, we could see dark and bright areas on its surface. It was obviously going to be interesting. Around the equator, there's a dark region called, from its shape, the whale. At its tail end, there's a round ring we call the donut. I mean, those will get proper names in due course. Those are just nicknames. But where the whale's mouth is, there is a beautiful, bright, heart-shaped, a large heart-shaped region, which seems to be a large low plane on Pluto. And that's being called Tombow Regio, after Clyde Tombow, who discovered the planet. And I'm sure that name will remain. It's very fitting that that is the most prominent feature on the planet that he discovered. When we got the first close-up pictures coming in, we found there's a range of mountains around the edge of this heart, Tombo Reggio, which are staggering. They're uh, 11,000 feet high or 3,500 metres high. That's as tall as the Rockies or the Alps. But they're made of ice. They're not made of rock. They're made of solid frozen ice. And on the top, there's a frosting of brighter material. Now, on the Earth, if you take the Alps, they're made out of rock. And on the top, you've got water frozen as ice or snow. On Pluto, the actual mountains are made out of ice and there's a frosting on top and that is because Pluto is moving away from the sun, it's getting chillier and the atmosphere is freezing. So substances like nitrogen and methane, which are gases on the Earth, are condensing down onto the mountains of Pluto. For me, the most intriguing images were the first close-up pictures of Charon, the big moon. It's not covered with craters like our moon is. Even though it's so small, it's got cracks around the equator, great canyons. On the right-hand edge, you can see a canyon that's far larger and deeper than our Grand Canyon on the Earth. And so deep that if you look at the edge, you can see it takes a notch out of the smooth edge of Sharon, where you can see black space behind it. And at the pole, at the top of the image, there's a dark area. There's some kind of blackish material strewn across the surface. 
Now the researchers are calling that Mordor, the land of evil because of its coloration. But in fact, this could be signs of the materials that make up life. We think what happens is that simple gases like methane, which have got carbon in them, join together to make more complex organic materials called tholins. And in the early solar system, materials like this would have given rise to life on planets like the Earth. At the moment, we don't really know what's going on with either Pluto or Charon. I, mean, I for one, certainly expected that both would be dead worlds, just cratered because there are always meteorites hitting bodies in the solar system, blasting out craters. And I thought they would have been pretty unchanged since the birth of our solar system. They are so far from the sun that they're not being warmed by the sun's energy particularly much. And if you have a body like the Earth, we have geology going in, volcanoes erupting, continental drift or plate tectonics, uh, and uh, that's driven by the heat from inside the Earth. But we thought that Pluto and Charon were both so small they would have run out of internal heat by now and frozen solid all the way through. So what we do know is there's some kind of new process going on, some kind of new geology, there's some kind of energy going on in both these bodies and we don't know what it is. So I'm looking forward to more and more results coming in over the next 16 months as New Horizons sends back all the data that it's stored on board from its brief fly past and we really get to grips with what's happening in these weird worlds at the edge of the solar system. Coming right back to Earth, there's some exciting action you can see for yourself during August. Our planet is ploughing through a stream of debris which has been cast aside by a comet called Swift Tuttle. And as the specks of dust stream into the Earth's atmosphere, they burn up in a shower of shooting stars. They seem to come from the direction of the constellation Perseus, the mighty hero from legend. So we call them the Perseid meteors. The, you can see some of the Perseid meteors throughout August, but they will come to a maximum on the night of the 12th. So go out that night and be treated to a shower of spectacular celestial fireworks. Thank you for joining me today, and I'll be keeping you updated on news from Pluto and Sharon as we get the results back here on Earth. And please send me your questions, anything to do with the outer solar system, what's beyond the planets, or anything about space and astronomy, I'll be very happy to answer. And subscribe to Nigel Goes to Space on Naked Science Channel.